Why do we keep failing on climate change? For more than a decade now, I've been thinking about the politics of climate change, working in government, think tanks, and university. And there's one question that's puzzled me. Actually, to be honest, it's a question that frustrates me. Often it really angers me. And when I think of my daughter, who's going to turn two next week, it's also a question that really saddens me. Why do we fail? Why is it that when governments pursue policies to address climate change, they too often lose the political battle? It's a question that saddens me because we all know what failure to act on climate change looks like. It looks like the bushfires that tore through millions of hectares of pristine forest in Australia last summer. It looks like the farmer standing alone in a dry wheat field that hasn't seen rain for years. And by the time my daughter is my age, it likely means that many of the places I've come to treasure, like the Great Barrier Reef with its, you know, with its abundance of colour and life, simply won't be around to see. This evening, I don't only want to answer the question, why do we fail? I want to answer a better question. How do we win? The key is we need policies that harness the power of politics, not just the power of markets. We need policies that focus on the benefits of climate action, not just the costs. Because if we continue to pursue policies that ignore political power, we simply won't have any climate change policies at all. So before I tell you more about that, let me tell you how I got to this place in my work. In order to understand how we might advance climate policies, I first obviously needed to understand that question that had been puzzling me for years. Why do we fail? Why is it that when governments pursue policies that economists prefer, such as putting a price on carbon with a carbon tax, or an emissions trading scheme, why does it fail or not implement it or not, simply not work? To answer this question, in 2015, I moved to the United States to study how climate and energy policy was being shaped there. For the next two years, I interviewed countless executives in all of the major energy industries. I spent countless hours sitting in the foyers of these gleaming glass towers, with my passport in pocket being ushered through security and up the elevator uh, into these immaculate boardrooms peering out over to these big American cities below. I sat in the offices of coal corporations. I met with executives of the oil and gas industry down in Houston. I met with their lobbyists in Washington, D.C., who were busy trying to campaign to expand the oil industry. I interviewed executives in the solar and wind industries. I met with small renewable companies that were just starting out, battling some of these incumbent industries. And I met with much larger renewable companies with revenues in the billions of dollars. Now, there's no one answer for why governments are failing to act at the speed and at the scale that we need to address climate action. But the more people I spoke to, the more I read, it became increasingly apparent what part of the answer was. What I've found, and what I've written about in my book, is that if you want to know what the principal problem is, the principal reason for the succession of failures that we see around the world on climate policy, it's opposition from the incumbent fossil fuel industries. It's opposition from oil, gas, and coal industries. On numerous occasions, I sat in these boardrooms I'm up in these beautiful boardrooms with these, you know, those windows that reach all the way up to the ceiling. And the lobbyist I'd come to meet, very generous, often charming, would sit down and tell me what they were doing. Often they were building these coalitions of big business groups. They were developing and plotting very detailed strategies. They were putting together sophisticated public relations campaigns. Why? Or to kill off the next piece of climate legislation the next piece of regulation that was working, for example, to limit emissions from coal or oil or gas. 
In fact, fossil fuel companies have been funding a multi-billion dollar campaign to question the science of climate change since the 1980s. They funded front groups, online groups, TV campaigns, consultancy reports questioning the scientists, questioning the conclusions of the science. And it's worked. If you don't believe me, take a look around. Half the country burnt down last summer. Do you know what the proposed solution is at the moment? Build more gas fossil fuel infrastructure. This is not what winning looks like. So how do we win? Well, I think to start with, the time, sadly, for incremental policies is over. We can no longer rely on the power of markets alone. Sure, that might have worked if we'd started in the 1980s, the 1990s, or even the early 2000s, but not today. We need big policies with big benefits that transform our economy. So what might this look like? Well, take Australia as an example. Imagine our country entirely powered by renewable energy. Large parts of our deserts covered in solar panels and wind turbines, producing enough energy and electricity to power our cars, to power a manufacturing industry that could employ millions of people. It would produce so much energy that the surplus could be exported in undersea cables to our neighbours in Asia, improving their lives and growing our economy. This is a vision that many of us are working on right here at the Australian National University. But we need the right policies to make it happen. We need policies that harness the power of politics. The first point I want to make on this is that we need policies that entrench and build existing clean energy industries. We need policies that grow our clean energy industries and that do so at speed. We need ambitious targets for our transport sector, manufacturing sector, industrial sectors. Markets won't get us there alone. They're simply not fast enough. Think about electric vehicles, for example. General Motors has been working on electric vehicles for about 20 years or more. Tesla, for about 10 years or more. Do you know what electric vehicle sales are in the United States right now? Less than 2% of total car sales. In Australia, it's less than 1%. How are we going to get 100% adoption rates of these new technologies in rapid time? Well, the answer is government mandates that make this happen. We need governments to set the rules of the game and back it up with big investments, billion-dollar investments in clean energy industries. As these industries prosper, not only will our air become cleaner, but we'll have new political allies in support of climate action. Imagine an electric vehicle industry, a multi-billion-dollar electric vehicle industry, lobbying to electrify our entire transport sector then pushing for policies, pushing our governments for policies to electrify our homes and our cities. But the second thing, point I want to make is we don't only need policies that are going to grow our existing clean in energy industries. We need to think carefully about policies that could actually shift the interests of those industries that are currently tied to fossil fuels. A good example of this is the aluminium industry. So aluminium smelters in Australia amazingly consume about 10% of the country's entire electricity. As a result of that, they also contribute about 6.5% to Australia's entire carbon emissions. Now, with those numbers, it's no surprise that over the last decade or two, the aluminium industry has been one of those industries battling against climate change. They've been actively lobbying for more than a decade to water down climate policies. But that industry is dying now, and thousands of jobs could be lost. They could also be saved. If the right government policies were put in place to upgrade those plant smelters, to transition the aluminium industry to clean, renewable energy industries, towns might be saved, cities might be saved that would be decimated by job losses. 
You know what also would happen? An industry that had long been opposed to climate action might actually become a vocal advocate for change. Of course, none of this will be easy. But with evidence of the climate crisis all around us right now, we need governments to act, we need them to act fast, and we need them to act at scale. But we also need them to act to build and grow political constituencies, industrial constituencies, in support of climate action. We need them to act in ways that shift the commercial interests of industries that have long been opposed to climate action. And we need them to highlight the benefits to our society, not just the costs. This is how we harness the power of politics. And this is what I'll tell my daughter we did to win. Thank you.